So you got the wine? Yeah, I, I, I felt like I needed wine, not beer. I'm trying to bring the level of kind of class and right. stuff. Let's, Just a little bit on we'll the show, that's all right. Where good ideas come from. Can you tell me where good ideas come from but in like a shorter answer than 300 pages. <laughs> no, it cannot, I have you, to spend you need all that? Okay. seven or eight hours at least. The big kind of myth that I'm trying to overturn with this book is this idea that ideas come from solitary, contemplative moments of you know, epiphanies and eureka moments when you're sitting there alone in your room and suddenly this great idea comes into your head. And what I've tried to do in the book is to go back and, and really look at the, the history of innovative places, basically, and figure out like what are the characteristic kind of properties of all those places. And it turns out that... So physical locations? Physical locations and okay. and kind of media locations. So it's everything from, you know, what are the what are the office environments, uh -huh. what are the kind of social environments, what are the media environments that have led to innovation. And even, there's a bit of a twist in the book, which is that I look at biological systems that have also been innovative. It's the idea that in, in biological systems, for instance, um, the adjacent possible, if you've got a soup of molecules, like right. we're talking about, in, in kind of the beginnings of life, there are a set of, you know, kind of, early basic elements that are there. And the adjacent possible is all the first order combinations that can form by those molecules kind of attaching to each other in kind of new ways. If, if you don't have that medium that allows all these you know, small little building blocks to be kind of reshuffled in new configurations, nothing ever happens, right? right. You don't get that kind of creativity. The environment needs to be right. The environment needs to be right. And so in the book I call that kind of the liquid network, right? Gotcha. And, and one example of that is in a sense partially the environment we're in right now, where people would get together from different backgrounds, different you know, kind of passions and interests, and they would just hang out and share ideas and talk about science and talk about politics and talk about religion. Mm -hmm. And the coffee house is a huge driver of innovation in Enlightenment era England in, and, of, and of France as well. Coffee houses, can bars also work? They, they work great for the first hour or two, and then they get <laughs> It's a problem. Good. Do you also talk about the lead up to 9-11? Yeah. I mean, can you talk about the failure to put together ideas um, and how, not how it led to that tragedy, but yeah. there were failures within the FBI, and why, why was that structure uh, yeah. not, not conducive to good ideas? Well, one of the, the themes in the book is this idea that you, you need to have these hubs where ideas can network and recombine, because most good ideas start as a, as a fragment of themselves. They start as kind of a hunch. And often those things need to collide with somebody else's hunch to really turn, turn into something interesting. And 9-11 is a great example of that because there, there are basically two hunches that had they been able to connect with each other, it might have actually changed the, the course of history on a, on a real level. One of them was the Phoenix Memo. Um, and the Phoenix Memo is you know, the, this memo by a, a FBI operative in, in Phoenix who noticed this weird pattern of uh, Middle Eastern men, some of whom had connections to kind of terrorist organizations who seemed to be enrolling in flight schools. And then three or four weeks later, in August, the Minnesota kind of 20th hijacker um, is picked up trying to learn how to fly a 747 without being interested in landing the 747, as the kind of famous story goes. The problem basically was that the FBI didn't have a system for connecting hunches. Um, and it basically had a system for keeping hunches in silos where they can't talk to each other. Do they still have that? They, they still use a they, they they use this kind of antiquated system. They they've tried to get off off of it, but technologically they're just kind of stuck. What are like some? I, I know this isn't simple. You you wrote 300 pages on it. Are there some simple things people can do to put themselves in an environment that's yeah, conducive yeah. to good ideas? What I've tried to do in, in my own life, and I think this is pretty good advice, is that I. I've kept this single file on my computer. It was originally a Word document. Now it's a Google Doc, so I can get to it anywhere. Yeah. You're I, just putting this I half idea. I put every single yeah. half, quarter, eighth of an idea that I've got at any different time, and I just write them down in one place. I spend no time organizing, right? I go back and I reread the entire file once every, like, three or four months. Every time I do it, there's some fragment from three years ago or five like, years oh. ago. I'm like, oh, now that finally makes sense. Okay. Do you ever go, wow, what the hell was I doing? No, no, no. It's like, wow, I really, how many glasses of wine did I have <laughs> when I wrote that? Yeah, you probably shouldn't go into that doc after you've been drinking a lot. Leave those ideas it's a, it's out. It's actually a great place yeah. to go when you've been drinking in, in some sense really? because, you know, altering your kind of internal chemicals 
pushes you in new directions. It will allow you to explore the adjacent possible in some ways. Problem is, in that exploring, a lot of the stuff you come up with is just garbage, right? Right. Um, and so some some of us more than others come up with a <laughs> lot of garbage. Yeah. We always ask who's your favorite alcoholic writer, but but usually that's like a novelist. And I think you know the the most interesting story is the is the Styron story, right? Where in terms of fiction, where he was he was a big drinker, an unbelievably successful, beautiful novelist. I think they had some kind of like barn in Connecticut where he would go and he would listen to jazz really loud and he would you know drink a bunch of cocktails and he would he would work. That is one kind of one kind of way of exploring the adjacent possible.